It's Holly's Hot Spurs, welcome back. Talking Tottenham every week, no better place to be sat. If it's a win, lose, draw, we'll be here for a chat. Best believe we tackle topics like Romero in the back. Young Min Son, what can go wrong when he's on form? It's a dream come true, so sit back, relax and vibe with us. Special guests every time. Hello and welcome to another episode of Holly's Hot Spurs Live, where tonight we actually have a win. Uh, to discuss. It's been a little while coming, um, but I'm very pleased we're here tonight to discuss it, obviously, after beating Newcastle 4-1 at home. And moving to do so, I'm joined by some fabulous guests. So first of all, Ben, it's lovely to have you on the channel again. How are you? Yes, very good, Holly. Thank you. Great to be chatting after a win. So much better yesterday, wasn't it? So much better. Oh, hello, Ben. Hello. hello, sorry. Yeah, all good. You cut halfway through. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no. <laughs> right. <laughs> a good start, wasn't it? Yeah, no, so much better um, yesterday, wasn't it? Really good performance, really good result. Yeah, no, definitely, 100%. Um, and it's nice that I set it all tonight. I'm also joined by Super Sub Jay. He's come in clutch once again, and he is in his own room uh, yes. for the first time on the channel. <laughs> How are you, Jay? Yeah, not bad. It's nice to have my setup back. Uh, yeah, no, brilliant. Yeah, a, a game that I was a little bit dreading yesterday, but proven wrong and what a game it was what a game it was definitely we've got a lot to talk about and i'm also joined by gareth gav it's amazing to have you back on again how are you all good holly all good great to be back on after one just thinking there the last time it was on we beat burnley 5-2 so i've been a good guest for you so far <laughs> um i'm not having as much luck with chris coyle unfortunately but um for you definitely whenever you seem to text me the week before a game we usually end up winning and winning quite well so hopefully that's a trend Indeed, indeed. And may it continue 100%. And welcome to everybody else that's, that's tuning in live, that's going to re-watch this as well. Hope you're all good. And we have got a lot to dissect. So let's jump in with it. So, Ben, I'm going to come to you first. Obviously, we needed a bit of a bounce back, obviously, after being defeated to, to West Ham. So how were you kind of feeling going into this one? I kind of felt like it, it... To me, it almost felt like a bigger game than it needed to be off of the back of that run of games. Um and it was always going to be a, be a big game anyway at home to another rival top four contender in Newcastle who are a good side, who are kind of as injury-stricken as us at the moment. So it felt like a big one. I think Thursday was almost the most, I think, the most frustrated I've been in this run of games because, again, like the performance was there, maybe not so much as a game like Villa or Man City, but again, it was a game that we should have won, like we should have killed them off in the first half. And I was, you know... I was nervous because it was like I didn't want us to find ourselves in the same situation again, but I also felt confident that with the injuries that they had, and you could tell, I think, off the back of the game, like how annoyed Postacobli was after that. And he is the sort of manager that if the performance isn't good enough, as he kind of alluded to in the press, I feel like as the group of players, you're going to know about it and you're going to want to put it right on in the next game. And I think that's exactly what I thought was going to happen. And that's exactly kind of, you know, it's yeah, yeah it was great. It was a really good performance. It really was. And I think the thing that kind of took me, Jay, um, coming to you, was the fact, obviously, of the lineup. We saw Richie uh, put back into the start line. So what did you kind of make of that when you saw his name on the team sheet? And, um, I think it was, you know, maybe a little bit for the plot lines with obviously what Callum Wilson and Michael Antonio have kind of been saying about him, you know, on their little podcast that no one listens to. Um, you know, it, yeah, for me, he needed a game like this. It was a big occasion. I thought he was really good against West Ham. Uh, you know, I, I thought he probably deserved a start, um, to be perfectly honest. Um, but yeah, kind of, uh, you know, Darren's kind of said it in the chat. I really wasn't expecting this kind of bounce back. I was kind of maybe hoping for a win, but, you know, not in this fashion. And it, with this level of control as well, it's really something. Mm, definitely. Because obviously, let's start like about that control. Because obviously, Gareth, the game kind of started and we started well. And I was kind of thinking, OK, 10, 15 minutes I'm kind of wanting a goal and it, it took a little bit of time coming but when it came obviously it was brilliant wasn't it no it's been a feature of how we've been playing this season i think that was the 10th game in a row we've took a lead as well so we, we we are fast starters which is something that we weren't used to under um conte it was very much we try to recover in second halves so it's been refreshing to have that approach um but like like the lads i think in the in the, in the run-up to the games it was more frustrated with the results in terms of the performances because the performances were there, maybe not a sustain. I thought for the only really spell in the game, is the Newcastle run the game was the 15 minutes after the, after the break. And once we get the third goal, it was controlled. Um, 
but as you said, it, it did take a, a while to get that first goal. And once we get that first goal, I think it was a confidence booster. Because I think we have been playing well, but sometimes when you're getting results, it can it can it can attack the confidence of the group. Um, but uh, you have to credit them because they they haven't shied away. They they keep they keep doing what Ange is, is looking to do. And I remember there was always that. Uh, I remember was it Mourinho who says at halftime when they were leading one 0 in games, he always told them they keep going. But there was this constant. They always sat back. I think that disproves that theory now because with Ange, you can see what he wants them to do. They keep attacking even when they're two 0 up, three 0 up. So it's just refreshing this whole season. I've really enjoyed it, Holly. There was results over the last few games have been tough. But as I said, it's been more tough big to accept because the, the performances have really been strong. The Wolves game is the only game I can think of this year where we didn't really turn up. We've kind of all alluded to it. I'm actually enjoying watching Tottenham again. And I think for me, that's what I wanted this season. Um, yes, OK, we've got to be patient if we want to win something. But it was just the enjoyment. I wanted that back. And obviously, there was some real enjoyment then, obviously, from that first goal. Uh, because it was a well-worked goal. And we finally managed to just shoot rather than try and walk it into the back of the net, didn't we? Yeah, and it kind of felt like a goal that proved Ange's changing system right. It was almost like moving Solly back over to the left and... You know, he was so dangerous all game against Trippier. It was almost just like that that kind of like classic one-on-one -on -one winger we've almost been looking for. It was that was him in that game. And he took Trippier to the cleaners, a bit like how Everton did in midweek. And it was great. And um it was a lovely goal. And it kind of just again exemplified how key our fullbacks have been this season. They did some really good analysis on Match of the Day last night, kind of talking about pretty much every goal in terms of their involvement, but and the general play, but that first goal in particular, the way they both come inside. And Adogi is able to pick the ball up, play it off, and then just make that straight run into the box and is there to finish off the chance. And it was, yeah, it was really well worked. And I think it kind of, yeah, indicative of that change, slight tweaking system and the changes that he made, but also, again, kind of an advert for the positive football that we've been playing. And it was a really, really good goal. Definitely. And I think with Adoji and Joe, coming to you, I think there's news today that he is obviously going to have that um, sustained contract, um, so to speak. So how, what is your kind of thoughts? Obviously, I know Ben's touching it with the fullbacks, etc. But it is really working how the way we're playing invertedly, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah, it's working and it, and it kind of, you know, it makes you harp back to all of the uh, the um, the pundits who the first couple of games where we were struggling and they were going, oh, Poro and Udogi aren't good enough to play that position. You know, they're just copying Guardiola with, you know, this kind of style of inverted fullbacks. But, you know, it's just the, um, it's just the how far up the field they are. They seem to be so confident. Like, you know, Pedro Poro was, for me, I think if Richarlison doesn't score two and Sonny doesn't have the game he has, it's probably... Man of the match for me. He's been probably our best player the last like three, four games. I'd say he's been so consistent. And you know, everyone kind of said that that fullback, inverted fullback role. You know, you need world class players to do it, but maybe you just need a really good manager who gives players confidence to be able to play like that. And you know, seeing D Destiny Adogi pretty much stood on the goal line tapping the ball in is is very much testament to Angie's system and the confidence he gives the players. Yeah, there is a lot of confidence, especially, like you say, from those inverted winners to go and have that free flow in football, that free reign to go and do what they kind of want to do. But Gareth, I kind of want to bring it back to Sonny because I know we've touched on it, the fact that obviously he wasn't playing down the middle um, this game and he was on the wing. And I'm going to be one of these people that I thought this season playing in the middle is probably best suited to him because maybe he's lost a bit of pace. But my word, yeah. I was definitely proven wrong uh, against Newcastle. I, it's one of them games we'll, we'll see in time. You know, because he did struggle initially on the left and then first few games, and I think that's why they moved him on side. You know, does one game yesterday, maybe that's the exception to the rule. I do think his game now as he is older. And I think technically as well, I spoke about this on Chris's show after the Man City game. I think Ange has done so much work with him. He doesn't seem to be giving the ball away as much. He seems to be able to link up play better. So I do think he has more suited to the role. I think Brendan Richardson was probably a smart move because we did need a focal point at times, especially when we were behind in games. We were struggling. Um, and that one Richardson should have scored against West Ham. You know, Sonny wouldn't have had that opportunity because it's not his game. So, you know, I think one thing we've seen about Ange is he's not afraid to make big decisions. You know, against Aston Villa, he played with Bendiker and the Celso in the, in the middle. You know, nobody could see that coming. So he always tries to find ways. And I think it's refreshing. How many times do we see Conte and Mourinho just go with the same team all the time? Um, and, you know, it, it was impossible for players that weren't playing to get into the team, really. So unless there was injuries. So I think it keeps everyone on their toes. And it was just perfect the way it worked out. And hopefully, I don't think long-term Richardson's the answer, but 
But I think hopefully now they can give him some confidence and maybe try and get through this season with him being a bad part player. Son on the left, we'll see Holly over the next few games. I think now you go on the Forest, you probably have to stick with that because it works so well against um, New, uh, against Newcastle. But I think once once we get the likes of Madison back, you know, as good as kuliseski has been in that number ten role, Madison comes back into the team, doesn't he? So it's it's difficult because I think Kuliseski's been better in, in the ten role. You know, well, you know, do they shift them back to right? But it's good they have options, and I think Brandon Johnson's looked better on the right hand side than on the left. So. We've got a lot of attacking options when, when players come back. So I think he's got a lot of flexibility there. And the likes of Saw and Johnson, Kulazewski can all play different positions. So, and I think it keeps opponents guessing. If, if Son, if you're doing your tactical analysis, maybe in a coach, and you don't know where Son's going to play, I think that only favours us. Definitely. It's a great headache to have um, as, as Ange. I mean, that's why he gets paid the money to be the manager, because he's got all these players that he can play in all these different positions. Um, and I think I'm going to come to you, Ben, for this one, because obviously that, that second goal um, that obviously we managed to score was the fact that Sonny managed to absolutely skin uh, Trippier. And that's not easy to do. And I know Trips hasn't had the best run of games at the moment in form, but it's a true testament to how Sonny's really working his game, isn't it? Yeah, he just looks so much more confident out there. I think he was a little bit lost in that West Ham game. And I think, you know, Gareth alluded to it there about that need for almost a focal point. And I thought the same thing coming into this game. And I was kind of advocating in the build-up for it for Richardson to play through the middle because you're going to be up against two physical centre-backs. You know, Newcastle will want to sit a little bit deeper and try and hit us on the break. So I think you need someone to come in and play through the middle. And that was only going to really be Richardson. And it allows Sonny to really do his thing out wide. And he, yeah, he skinned Trippier for both goals. The first one was maybe a bit of a more, a bit more like conventional Sonny in the sense of that little step over and then low hard cross across the box, just hoping someone was there and the doggy was there to tap it in. But the second one, that's what we want to see. We just want to see, like take him to the byline. And you look at Man City and you know, dare I say it as well, look at Arsenal, the amount of goals they kind of score from those kind of cutbacks and working it into the box. That's what we need to be better at. And when you've got that many players running into the box, whether you've got Richardson in there. Adogi, Poro, whoever it is running in, Kulazewski as well, you're only going to keep scoring. And it just makes it look so much more simple. I think as well, that second goal, you know, not just for Richardson, but for the whole team, that gave them so much more confidence. We were playing well up until that and deservedly took the lead. But that second goal, I think, after everything that's happened in the last five or six games of, you know, Tottenham going in front and letting the lead slip and Spurs in, all this and that, that second goal just made them play. They almost grew like a foot taller and you could see it in players all over the pitch. And it was just like, and as a fan as well, like it just gave you a little bit of like, you could just relax a little bit more after that. And I know we've got, you know, we've thrown bigger leads away than that over the years, but it was, yeah, it was so, that second goal was massive. Yeah, it really was. And I think, like you said, it's great that you said from a fan's point of view, because there's been many times in, in recent games where I am losing my head because we haven't managed to, <laughs> to hit the ball in the back of the net. Um, so, no, it was great, obviously, to see and obviously for Richarlison um, to get that. Um, Jay, but I want to talk to you about, obviously, the, the second half or the start of the second half, because uh, I'm not going to lie. I was a little bit stressed because it felt like Newcastle were growing a little bit more into the game. Would you say that was the case as well? Yeah, definitely. That that it was the it was the oh that was a good half of football, and then the second half started, and you were like, oh please, let's not like Ben kind of said about this reputation that we've kind of got at the minute of throwing stuff away. You know, it was the classic. Not to sound like Michael Owen here, but the next goal was very important. You know, whoever <laughs> scored the next goal, you know, it was it was going to make a big difference in the game, and and I think for us to get that goal was huge after you know the amount of pressure that uh Newcastle put us under but I think that's really testament to um, to the defense and I don't know if it was one of the talking points but one of the standout players yesterday for me as well was Ben Davies uh I can't believe what I'm seeing you know from him um you know I've been on this coming on this podcast for years and I had him dead for rights a couple of seasons ago um but all of a sudden he seems to be playing with uh, a confidence it looks like he's had a leg transplant because he's like 20 times faster than he has been the last couple of years you know the way he sprinted back for the block it, it was incredible and I did not think I thought that was a guaranteed goal but you know I think the whole time your back four stays on the pitch for the whole game and I know we conceded late but it was a scrappy goal it doesn't count but pretty much essentially keep a clean sheet and not lose any players you know, is a real testament to how good of a defensive unit we are. And I think, you know, it's that thing of 
we were under pressure from Newcastle, but they didn't score. So they could put us under all the pressure they want. But as long as our defence stands tall, then there's nothing else to worry about. It's a great point, actually, that you've mentioned, obviously, Ben Davies. Because, Gareth, I think I've probably been someone, I think, in recent games when I was watching the likes of Emerson and yourself at the back, I was a bit worried. But it seems like when, and I know we'll get onto Romero a little bit later, but it seems like that block that Jay was mentioning actually, I think, managed to keep the game as it was. That could have been a massive changing point um, if they managed to score from that. No, massively. And, and that is the risk with this style of play that we are being caught out at times. I mean, I mean that, that was crazy because... Our whole, our whole back four was actually in its own half. So I think that was a mistake. I, I don't think that was by design because obviously then it plays everyone on site if you're in your own half. So I think it was just one of them moments. But as you say, it was a big moment because, you know, we were on top at that time without, you know, we weren't, we, we did, as, as Ben mentioned, we did, we did kick on when the goals were done. But I mean, that could have been a massive confidence booster. You know, we could have, we could have one nil down. That would have been, you know, we haven't had it come back too many times this year because we've usually been up in games and you just don't know. And sometimes games, goals change games. And we've been on the wrong side of that over the last few games where, you know, we've had goals and they've knocked the stuff out of us. I don't think we really recovered from the West Ham equaliser, to be totally honest, because of we dominated the game and, you know, a freak goal. And we didn't really recover. And this, this could have been an R one. Um, and it was really important for us to win that game. And, and then we won it quite comfortably. But, you know, getting on to Ben Davis, I think he takes a lot of critics um sometimes but i think ben ben always gives you what he's got i think over the years he's he's, he's not at the level of a romero or a van de ven he never was um he's obviously gradually declined from when he came here but he's he's reliable he can play at center back he can play at left back um and i think he's one of the he's one of the players that's always been professional um even when maybe he wasn't enjoying us at the football and the previous managers but i think as ben as, as jay alluded to i think everyone around the club at the moment it's not just the coaching, but I think they're enjoying the style of play. They're enjoying the the environment they're in. Therefore, you know, I think it was I watched Madison's interview with Ben Foster, and like he was saying, and just motivational speeches, just wanting to make you run through a brick wall from. I think that's the that's the real difference. That even the players that are on the sideline, on the bench, you know, they're just enjoying the whole atmosphere, and they're they've come on and played a part in injuries. You know, a few players could easily have down tools, like so Harvey Eric, who you know could have moved could have been moved on the summer. It was clear he wasn't going to be part of the first. 13, 14 players for selection if everyone's fit. But I think that's just, it shows you the different environment we're on now, Holly, and it's so refreshing to see. I mean, I'm just, every weekend, I'm just loving watching the team. No, and I think that's for me as well. I think, well, I think it's everyone in that kind of sense. You can see it in the ground. You can see it, obviously, I was there for the Chelsea game, and obviously that was a bit mental. But me too. everybody was still singing and behind everyone. And yeah. Ben, that's just something Ange has managed to do. I know every week we talk about Ange, but it is true testament. Even when we've had that little bit of rough patch, we're still going out there and playing the Ange way. And, and this week it's, it's paid off. It can only get better, can't it? Yeah, 100%. I think he kind of alluded to it when we were going through our difficult period. And you're only going to learn more about yourselves as a squad when you kind of go through those challenges. And it allows you to learn things to put in practice to be able to, to, be able to turn those results around. That's exactly what we saw yesterday. People have said that, you know, he's not... He hasn't got a plan B, you know, he doesn't want to change, he doesn't want to budge away from his style. But he's done that. You don't you don't have to compromise. You can make changes without compromising your style. And that's exactly what he's done and had to kind of tinker around and figure it out in the Villa game, the City game. And yesterday he changed the shape compared to the previous games. He had to do that, brought Kulusevski in, in into the 10, played Johnson out on the right. He had to, you know, he had to figure things out and You've got to allow him the opportunity to do that. And he's reaping the rewards of it yesterday. It was yesterday just felt like everything had just come together. All of those kind of learnings from those previous five games, whether the performances were or weren't good enough. And I think like Gareth said earlier, the Wolves one was the only one really you look at that and say, we played poorly. We didn't deserve anything maybe from that game. And West Ham maybe a little bit as well. But even that, we would, you know, we should have won that game. Um, and what I loved about yesterday with Postacoglu is that he's always kept, and we'll you know, come on to the second half in a minute, but like with that third goal, he very rarely breaks away from that kind of like stone faced, like, you know, every time we score, it's just like a little fist bump, just like nothing, no expression change whatsoever. But the way Porro ran over to him after playing that ball and he just let go and it was just like, it was so brilliant to see that. And I think, you know, like, you know, like Gareth said as well, like the players are just enjoying playing. Like you listen to them, you see like I saw a video going around earlier of um, the injured players that were just sat behind the bench yesterday when the first or second goal went in and the way they're all jumping up and down. And it's like, 
one that makes me feel a little bit about, better about Mickey van der Ven's hamstring, the way he jumped off his seat. But like, <laughs> it was, um, you know, it was just so good to see that kind of feel good factor is running through the club. And you know, we're as a fan base, we've had to put up with a lot of crap over the last few years. But like, you know, we're not the sort of fan base that we could we, like we can see where we're going. Shut out all the noise over the past few weeks and questions around the manager and questions around the group of players and whatever. We can we're very good, I think, generally as a fan base of kind of shutting that out and just getting on with it and cracking on. I think that's been that's almost reflected in Postacoglu's attitude. Yes, he wasn't happy after West Ham, and he's you know he's never going to be completely happy. You're a manager when you're looking at it with a coach's lens. You're always going to be more critical than the average fan or pundit or whatever it is. But like he's just an I think he's just that embodiment of kind of how we. You know, it's it's so great to have someone like him who you can just throw everything behind and just say this is our guy. But I've never felt more confident, even more so maybe than Pochettino, that we're heading in the right direction under Postecoglou. I, I just love him, love him so much. I'm, I'm glad you've mentioned Poch because whenever somebody says it, I just look at Jay and smile. I mean, Jay, I know your yeah. thoughts on Pochettino, and I know that Ange. I don't want to say Ange is, is is a carbon copy of Poch because I don't think that's necessarily true. Just his play of football and attacking football is, is is nice to watch, and we're enjoying it, and we're getting results. But for you, do you think obviously with the fan base that we're all actually connected for once? Do you think this time you see there's a project forming? Is that oh, well, kind of what you see? The, the my criticism of Pochettino is not that there was a project not formed, and not that he wasn't a good manager. That's not my argument. I do, I do. I, there are similarities between him and Ange in the sense of, you know, the squad's kind of playing above its level, I'd say, uh, at the minute. Um, and for me, it is, it is the vibes thing. You know, it is pure vibes at the minute. It seems like the difference, I'd say, between Ange so far from what we've heard, Ange and Poch is, you know, if you look at Chelsea at the minute, Poch has taken his system of training from Tottenham to Chelsea, and you're seeing what that's doing to this young Chelsea squad, which is exactly what it did to our Spurs team towards the end. You know, it kind of ran people into the ground, whereas it goes back to what we're saying with, with Ange. It just seems to be a real good feel-good factor. It seems that he's getting the levels right. He's handling the media correctly. Even in his criticism of players, he's doing it in a way in which it's constructive. And it, he never seems to whine or moan. Um, but... I think that's the thing. It's kind of like, you know, a lot of people don't like Spurs at the minute because they can't find a reason because they love Ange so much. It's like, you know, he he's kind of, you know, we're still rivals with teams and people still don't like us. But, you know, he, he kind of commands a respect from opposition fans and players and managers, which is a very weird thing to have as a Tottenham fan. <laughs> no, I think you're right, Jay, and that, um, I'm not trying to like wind you up mentioning Potter's name. But I, I, I think it's a quite a good analogy uh, to discuss in terms of that kind of because we always talk about that comparison between Potch and Ange and it, it's it's nice to have that kind of discussion um but Gareth I know Ben's obviously spoken about how Ange was um obviously jumping for joy from that Pedro Porro cross to Richarlison so, so let's talk about it because obviously I think Ange was so happy because that's what he's been wanting um from the likes of Pedro Porro to find obviously Richarlison that we're all glad has managed to get two on the score sheet uh, I mean Pedro Porro, the man that's playing out of his skin, is probably the most surprising out of everybody. Well, I mean, we always knew he had ability, but I thought his ability would be like running past players and you know, maybe whipping crosses on. He's completely, he's, he's almost playing like an Alexander Arnold. Obviously, not maybe hitting the level of passes and the, on on a more consistent basis. But even yesterday, the, the heck, I not make three. Heck, he not make three players yesterday. You know, stuff like that. He's he's, he's playing with so much confidence. If you actually look at the, I think it was the second goal. He almost just gets it. He's on and Trubier just about heads it. So he has been, he has been quite successful. We certain. I think the Burnley fifth goal he played a, like a Kevin De Bruyne pass through. So it wasn't like it was a one off. Pedro this season's been been excellent. Um, I think there's still question marks defensively. I think he still needs to improve defensively at times. But I mean, as te as technical as it gets, I mean, I wouldn't swap RT fullbacks for any RT fullbacks in the league at the moment. Not to say there isn't better out there, but I, I just think they're playing so, so well that they're vital to the system. Um, and that, interestingly, the Wolves game was the only game that we, you know, it was apart from the first game where Emerson played against Brentford. Since then, it's, the Wolves has been the only game where we doggy wasn't playing and Emerson come on, I think, where we've been on balance with the right foot on the left side. I know Emerson did quite well in the Palace game, but Ben Davis was pretty poor in the first half. 
So when them two have played, we've looked really, really well balanced. And it's interesting because I think Poro sometimes comes on and 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 do the midfield more. And we've seen a doggy playing as almost like a striker at times. So it's not easy. They're, it's almost like the two are giving you two different, two different um you know qualities. And it's just really, really working at the moment. I am, you know, and Ange is is even. I think it's testament that they be on that run. They have one point from five games, and nobody was worried. Nobody was panicking. Um, you know, and it's very rare, especially at a, at a club that are supposed to be challenging for Europe, can lose that many games, and and you know, no pressure because you look at someone like West Ham. West Ham fans aren't happy with Moyes yet. They've only lost one or last six games. And before that Fulham game, they weren't happy. Even after the the Spurs won, there was a lot saying it was very fortunate, and they're not happy with the style of football. So the style of play does does matter to fans. Obviously, results are important, but that style of play gives you a foundation. They believe, and trust me, at the moment, there's very few Spurs out Spurs fans out there not believing. A hundred percent, and I think that's the thing. I think we all want to win as fans, but I think after watching. Uh, the, the football we had to watch the last couple of years and still haven't won anything. I think we are kind of all on, on the Ange train to, to enjoy our football again. Um, but Ben, I'm going to come to you because obviously there's lots of mentions for, for obviously who should be uh, the man of the match. Um, I think everybody played amazingly. Um, but I want to talk about obviously that midfield because Saar is something else, isn't he really? He's he's unreal. I am um, he before he went off. I think he went off around 70 75 minutes. I think it was that was the player in my mind that stuck out the most as man of the match. He was just like everywhere. He was everywhere. He, I think, one of the big things as well is that we've been talking in the last few weeks since the Chelsea game how maybe Basuma's performances haven't been up to the standard that we saw in the first 10 games before Chelsea. I think Saar is a massive part of that. I think he's one of those players that doesn't really get, not from the fan base, like we all love him, but like from the outside. And I'd rather it be kept that way. I'd rather some of these players kind of fly under the radar, whether it's Poro, Adogi, Saar, whoever it is. And I think he kind of falls into that category as well. He was immense yesterday, absolutely immense. And it's like, he was such a big miss against West Ham. Even when he came on against West Ham, he looked, you know, far more like, and that's not really his role, but he just looked like doing something every time he got the ball. And it's just, it's very weird. It's funny with Saar because, you look at him sometimes and you don't necessarily think he's the most like on the ball. He's not the most spectacular player in the world. He's not going to, you know, like he's not going to pick a pass maybe or like, but the work, job he does for the team and the way he carries the ball up the pitch, there was a moment in the second, in the first half, just I think after we scored the second goal where I think between Romero and him, they brought the ball out from the back and got us going up the pitch. And I, like it was one of the best moves of the game. And it was just like that swagger that Saar had as 20, 20 years old, right? It's just like, he is, he is incredible. And he, for me, obviously we mentioned Adogi uh, earlier on about the new contract. He's the next one Spurs need to tie down because, you know, he won't keep flying on the radar for so long. And, you know, he's going to have moments throughout the season like he did against Man United where he's almost thrust into the spotlight a little bit more because he can arrive late in the box and score. Like he had that half chance yesterday whether that sweeping counter-attack that he kind of swept even further walked wide towards the corner flag where maybe he could have left it for a Charleston. But, you know, he's just got that confidence to arrive late in the box. And if he can add maybe five, six goals a season to his name, he is going to be one of the best box-to-box -box midfielders in the league. And, you know, he, yeah, I just, I love watching him play. And he makes such a difference to us. It's something that a year ago we wouldn't be having this conversation. Now it's a completely different style of playing, a completely different system. But I remember from the first time he came in against Crystal Palace last season off the bench when we beat them uh, just after Christmas, I remember watching him for the first time and thinking this kid is special and he's going to be something. And I think we're all seeing it now and he's got such a bright career ahead of him. It's just amazing how young he is. I think that's what I forget Can't sometimes with these players. Is, it's the age. They're still young and they're still learning, yet they're at this level already. And another player I want to highlight, Jay, is, is Johnson. Um, because him himself could have had a goal for his name uh, against, obviously, Newcastle. It didn't quite happen. But what do you make of his performance so far this season and, obviously, in the Newcastle game? Uh, yeah, he's, he's, I, I want to see a bit more end product from him. I definitely think he's so um, lively. And kind of, I think Ben said it earlier on in, in the in the podcast, he definitely looks a lot better off the right. I can't remember if it was you or Gareth that said that, but, you know, he definitely looks better off the right. Um, and his, his speed and his explosiveness is a real worry for teams. OK, maybe his end product hasn't been there quite yet, but still the threat that he put, you know, I've kind of, you know, he's kind of got um, 
a, a Dan James kind of feel to him. You know, you're always kind of scared that he could just out of nowhere blitz down the field and, and be in an on goal. He might not score, but, you know, he'll be in on goal. Um, and having that kind of speed and, and threat in the team is kind of essential. But, yeah, uh, the thing is for me is when everyone's fully fit and 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 when Madison's back is who gets dropped. You know, if Son's scoring goals, Richarlison's scoring goals, Decky's playing really well in the 10, you know, I can't imagine Madison playing as an eight. I really couldn't. I don't think I could see that, maybe. But I can't see him playing as an eight. If, if Ange wanted to keep Decky in the 10, it'd be very unbalanced. But, yeah, it, you know, I think Johnson needs a couple of goals if he wants to be that guy. If he wants to be that guy, he needs a couple of goals. And who better to score against than Forrest? Very, very true. Well, Lee, I mean, you've you've put that in quite nicely there, Jay, but I'm going to put pause on that uh, just for a second. And I know that you've mentioned, obviously, it's going to be really difficult when these players come back. So, obviously, you've got Benton Cole coming back into the fold. Does that mean Saar potentially misses out? There's It's a massive headache, isn't it, Gareth, for, for Ange to think when all these players are fully fit. But if it was you, who do you think Ange has got in his mind once these players are back? What's that midfield looking like? No, well, I think Ben made a fantastic point because I was thinking the same to you about... I think when Sars on there, Basuma's workload's reduced as well. I think sometimes Basuma looked a bit exposed in them games with Lacelso and you know Kill the Decky playing there. They're not naturally defensive players. I think Sar in there, definitely in the big games away from home. You know, you think about Man City, that first half, we were under serious pressure at times. You think you, you need players like when you go to these grounds, it's great helping that attack on football. And we still will attack, but you still have to be disciplined as well. And I think in your big games, you're definitely going to have Basuma and Sar in there. And Madison has to play. You know, he was probably the best player in the league before he before his injury. You know what I mean? So difficult one because I think again he's going to be disappointing certain players, you know, because they haven't done much wrong. You know, you look at La Celso, maybe it was maybe it was it was down to so many games and so many days, but he probably felt like he was unlucky to be left out. You know, he's been scoring goals, he's been he's been creating chances. Um, but I think it's it's he's got a great touch of knowing what team they play in what game. I think that's, you know, he can't, I have not, I've not sat there too many times this season and thought, oh, he's made a bad mistake here. He, he, he usually nails it. Um, and I think, you know, especially next season, it'll be tough. It'll be more different Tolly, next season because we're going to be, you'd imagine we're going to be in some sort of European competition. So there will be more opportunities they would hit. Um, but for me, my preference would be the midfield we started the season with. I know Bentecourt looked really, really good against Fulham, but I just think that was a really, really good balance dot. Um, you know, we've Saar, Saar, Basuma and Madison. And, and coming on to Johnson, again, I think Jay spot on. I think he's doing everything right, just the goals aren't coming. And he's like, even yesterday, he had the post twice. You know, I mean, that second one, how it didn't go on. And I mean, that would have been one of the goals of the, that would have been one of the goals of the season, the way they moved it. Saar's flick, Kulazveski's pass. You know, and it shows you calls Vessi, you know, it's one thing seeing it, but he, he he put the right weight on it and everything. Uh, you know, so there's a lot more to come from Decky as well in that role. I think sometimes on that right side he looks a wee bit predictable coming on the left side and he's not we know he's not strong, he's right footing. Sometimes that's just the way we left left footers, they really struggle with we right footer we're using the right foot. Um, as we've seen over the years by a lot of left footer players. So um great to have options. And I also think what whoever comes in will never let us down. That's just the way I feel at the minute. You know, a lot of people were panicking, um, you know, when we lost all them players. But as I said, apart from the Wolves game, I don't think we played poorly in any other game. Um, and that was such a surprise, having so many players missing. Like, I think five of your first 11 was wiped out for the first couple of games, anyway, at least, with Romero suspended. Um, and that nearly the whole spine of the team was affected. And it didn't really change the style of play. And if you look at it, I think the first half against West Ham, the first half against Villa, and certainly, El Manchester, we've pl we arguably played better than some of the games we played earlier in the season that we won. Like, I don't think we we're particularly that great away at Palace, and we won that game with everyone there. So, I think it's just so refreshing that he, he sort of, whoever comes on, you almost feel that they're going to be reliable. Hmm. And it is a nice feeling to have because there's been so many times in, in previous seasons, I know it was a different system, this, that and the other, but everybody seems to be on the same page, which is so nice um, um, to have. But obviously, Ben, I want to talk about um, the little incident towards the end of the game. Uh, and that was uh, Romero the egg, as I like to call him. Um, <laughs> what do you kind of, of make of, of Romero and that kind of incident? 
I just could like it's just it's so frustrating because he on his day and in terms of just defensive ability and the way he progresses the ball out from the back, he can be one of the best defenders in the world. That like that's not that's not of an over exaggeration. He is a brilliant, brilliant defender on that cusp of being world class. And I think that's that is what will stop him. Just it was just so ridiculous yesterday. And I didn't mind it because it was on Callum Wilson, and I'm sure we'll talk about that at some point. But it was so ridiculous. It's just like he's, he was so lucky not to get a red card. And it was, I am, um, you know, we've, uh, whether it's Spurs fans or any other fan in the Premier League, has kind of almost been glued to the uh, ref watch on Sky Sports News on a Monday morning for various reasons over the last few weeks because of the amount of controversy we've seen. Dermot Gallagher came out and said that he didn't think it was a red card, and it was like it didn't immediately jump out to him. And they, the rest of the panel were like, what they were like I couldn't couldn't believe it and it was if you're being kind to him he mistimed it but i don't think he did like the ball was gone wilson was gone he was kind of already going down he was away like it's so frustrating and i think especially as well if you're going to um if if when you've got van der ven back and i know van der ven's not that sort of player in the slightest anyway so i wouldn't worry about it but when van der ven's there you're supposed to be the experienced calming influence on van der ven um, and stuff like that's just going to let you down over the course of the season because, like I said, he can be one of the best in the world. But if he'd got if he got red if he'd got a red card yesterday, he would have been out for four games. And then it's like because he's already just come back, so it's like yeah. you can't. He's no use to you if he's going to spend ten games out of thirty eight in the Premier League on you know on the bench because he can't play. And it's just so so frustrating, so frustrating because he can be one of the best. And I think it was the timing as well. I know Darren said here as well, the fact that we were, what, 3-0 up at this point? Um, Jay, no need for it at all. That's, that's the thing, isn't it, Jay? It's the timing of it as well. It's almost like he's seen red again. That's it. You're getting kebabbed, isn't it? Well, you know, I thought he'd had a phone call that Argentina wanted him to play, so he wanted to get himself sent off, you know. It's, it's just, you know, it, for me, it was, I, I... VAR's created this problem for the league because, for me, that's... 100% after seeing one replay, one angle, it's 100% a red card. And, yeah. and uh, you know, very, I don't want to use the word deluded because, you know, I don't know who watches this podcast, but, you know, I know you'd have to be quite deluded to not think it's a straight red um, because you've, you've seen it throughout the league. But this is this is the issue. You know, I, I'm, I was nearly exposed. I was watching it on Sky Sports <laughs> with my friends and... Um, you know, we would we were all saying that uh, there's no way it's not a red because if you look at reds that have been given this season, it's exactly the same. But then also, there's been so many incidents this season where clear reds haven't been given, yeah. and they've been looked at by VAR, and it just goes back to this classic thing with Romero. With that level of scrutiny, you know, it happened. And my first instinct was, what, well, like, like Ben said, oh, well, that's him gone for another couple of games. Like, you know, it's just like, why? It was so unneeded. And and a couple of our friends are, are very quite critical of him. And, I, and I'm really starting to see it now because, you know, he it, it was just so unneeded. And at that stage of the game, you know, with the Spursy mentality, you know, 10 minutes to go plus added time with 10 men against Newcastle who pumped us for seven last year, you know, you can't, you know, you can't be doing that. And especially if he's part of the leadership team, it, for me, it really calls into question his character. And, and he is like Ben said, probably for me, one of our best players in terms of international reputation. I'd say he's probably like, you know, one of our bordering on world-class players. Um, but that is what's holding him back. That's what's yeah. holding him back. And and he's got it in him. And every time you go in for a tackle, you love it until you see the replay and realise that he's halfway up his leg. You know, <laughs> it's just, yeah. Right. He definitely needs to try and iron it out. But Gareth, this isn't the first time it's happened. Is it something no. that's going to be within him that is just, you can't change him, that is Romero? Or do you think Ange may be able to cut you out of him? In my opinion, we've got a major problem now because you can't trust him. I mean, it's one thing, he has had red cards, and his time here, I think maybe I think he might have had two yellow cards, um, twice, and I think they are one. He got a straight red, um, for Chelsea, wasn't it? Um, I think it was a Europa League conference game he got sent off. And yeah. anyway, he's had a lot of he's had a lot of red cards, but I think some of them were maybe not as bad as the Chelsea one. The Chelsea one, 
was a bad one, but you look at that and think, right, especially with how he suffered, surely that's a wake-up call he needs. And his second game, his, sec, his second game back, it goes and does that one. It's, I mean, the Chelsea one, you can say maybe it was unintentional, maybe he slapped or this one is clear intentionally. He, he goes out, he do the fella. And I was actually in a group chat and some of them Liverpool fans and they were saying, surely you can't back him anymore. And I says, it is starting to look like he's a thug on a football kit and he's just out to hurt people. Um, and the, the worrying thing is that, as, as the lad said, he he would have been done for four games. Um, and then that would have been seven games out of, out of what, 16 games he's missed, um, which would have been absolutely crazy. Um, I think Ange says after, after the, the, la- the last press conference that he didn't speak to him. Um, and But I think he, he would have definitely spoke to him this morning and says, look, this is up. Because I think, Holly, we're on the... We're on the, we're on the we're in the predicament now. If it was to happen again, I think we'd seriously have to think about moving him on in the summer. You know, because as, as for good, how good he is, if he's going to get, if he's going to let you down time and time again, does that outweigh what he gives you? Um, and 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 that is the saddest thing about it because he's such a good player. I have a, I, I was abs- I was loving the game yesterday, and that really put me in bad form because once I seen one replay, I saw as a cert red yard, and now we're going to be up up a left again for four games, having to play two fullbacks there. Um, and I mean, uh, as, as the lads, he's part, supposed to be part of the leadership team, and it, it would have been really, really letting us down. And I, I and I think he's very fortunate, not just in terms that he didn't get sent off, but the fans, I think, would have lost patience with him. Because if we had a supper for the next four games, because of you know, I wouldn't have blamed Emerson Ryan and Ben Davis for mistakes going on because it's not really their their first positions. So I would have been looking at Romero's needless wreck yard. Um, so I think now it, it has come to a point where it has to be sat down and told. I mean, I, I was shouting, talk him a week's wages if you have to, just to prove a point to him that he that it's not just about you know you, it's about what it's about your teammates and the fans and everyone here. Um, because imagine we had a, we we lose him for four games and Ange has an hour sticky spell, then he becomes under pressure because it's all well and good us supporting him, but results will always dictate. And you know that that you don't know, you just don't know what can happen in football. So hopefully now, maybe after that second one now, he really gets a good chat and he's told this is how it is. And Holly, as sad as it would be, if it was to happen again, I would seriously think about cashing them in the summer, try and get as much money from him and get a more reliable player on there beside Van de Ven. Because you don't want to lose the the good start that Van de Ven's had as well because he's playing with somebody he can't trust. Um, and, I w- and eventually it will cause friction in the dressing room if he keeps getting sent off because there'll be a divide. Um, and I think he is quite popular on there. So I, I think now... Let it let it summer and hopefully that's the end it. We don't see any more, but we don't want to take the aggression out of them. But we do we we do want to take the madness out. <laughs> I think that's the best way to put it. Take the madness out, and because he is, he, well, he just sees red, and that's it. You're getting kebabs. And I think I know that debate's been swinging around Twitter lately at the sense of do we cash in for him? But hopefully it is literally three strikes or you're out, and he's up to two. So hopefully that is the last we'll see of Romero clattering people. Um, but let's obviously move on. Um, and, and the fact that we do have Nottingham Forest coming up next. So Ben, I'm going to come to you first. How are you kind of feeling uh, for this one? Feeling really good going into this. I mean, I'm not. that's not a guarantee that I think we're going to go there and win. But I just feel like when you look at Forest and how they've been struggling recently, Steve Cooper's under pressure, not necessarily from the fan base, because I think we saw it last season when they got to a similar point or maybe further down the road like after the World Cup where he was under real, real pressure from the outside. The results not going his way, but the fan base backed him all the way and there was a real chance that he was going to get sacked, but the uh, the board changed their mind. Um, and again, they got a good point away at Wolves at the weekend, but they've had a really couple of sticky results after that. But the city ground is always going to be a tough place to go, especially on a Friday night. They're going to be bang up for it. Um, and yeah, it's going to be tricky, but I do feel like this is a game where, you know, if we want to show that we're serious, we've got to go there and say, right, you know, we've got the win back in our sails now. Let's play with that confidence. And we saw that, you know, when we had to play Monday, Friday, Fulham uh, again, and Fulham, and then on to Palace, we showed how well we took the momentum from the Fulham game into the Palace game, even though it wasn't one of our most fluid performances. We got the job done and we were the better team. And I think, again, we've got to do the same thing. We've got to go there and win because. There's going to be a few teams now um, around our kind of position in the league playing each other. I know Liverpool have got United at the weekend. You expect some Liverpool win there. But if we can put some breathing space between us and Man United, although I'm not too concerned about them, I think they're 
mm. position the table flatters them very, very much. Frank Liverpool play Arsenal too the week after, don't they? Exactly, yeah. So there's going to be the next couple of weeks kind of looking beyond the Forest game. There's a lot of teams playing each other around our kind of position in the table. So Forest needs to be the start of that run. So, oh no, I know we beat Newcastle, but in terms of the run of the next games, that has to be the run where we look at kind of clawing some of the points back um, and kind of closing the gap between the top four and us. So I'm I'm confident. I'm just looking forward to seeing us play again. It's just one of those things like turned up to the ground on Sunday and despite what happened in the last few weeks and you're just buzzing. As soon as the team come out, it's like, right. And as soon as you see the team selection, you know, you don't know what's going to come out, but that's that's a good thing. In previous managers under, I know Conte was very reluctant to kind of change his system uh and players but Mourinho I remember I used to say to my stepdad when we used to watch the games it was almost like playing bingo with what defense he was going to pull out and it was in a bad way whereas now like you're kind of looking forward to seeing oh well, I wonder if Andrew will tweak this for this game I wonder if he'll him bring him back in like nobody I don't think anybody was really expecting the Celso maybe not to play on Sunday but I wanted to make a point actually off the back of I know it's a bit of a tangent but what I've, Gareth said earlier in terms of like the selection headache that we've got and obviously this plays into Forest on uh Friday it almost just excites me even more because in previous years, and you can see at other clubs, imagine, look at Chelsea, for example. Look at the amount of players they've got sitting on the periphery thinking, what am I doing here? Whereas at Spurs, Postacoglu has kind of created the environment that allows any player that might have been on the fringes, might have been talking about leaving, you know, buttering up his agent, asking to look for moves, players that didn't seem happy, like the Celso, Hoybier was going to move on, all these other players. And but I think they're all willing to play because they know that if you can come in in this sticky period and gain that trust from the manager and believe in what he's trying to do, then that will go a long way. And even if your long term future isn't at the club, with someone like Hoybier's probably isn't, you know, he will want to go and start somewhere. But he might bring someone in on Friday against Forest that we didn't necessarily expect. And it's like, okay, right, he trusts him, see what you can do. You've seen it with Newcastle, the amount of injuries they've had. They've had 17 year old Lewis Miley go in there, play really well over the last few games. And he knows that as soon as maybe a couple of the other players come back, maybe Tonali comes back, that his position in the team is probably gone. But he knows in a, in a few weeks' time when they might have get another injury or want to tweak it slightly, he knows he can come back to that player and say, right, you're in. I know you I know you trust the system. I know you get it. So I think for Forrest, to counteract that, I'm not sure we'll see any changes because I think that really we were such a fluid attacking force on uh, Sunday so I'd like to see the same team but if he was to tweak it slightly and bring someone like the Celso in to get a bit more control in the midfield away from home even though that wasn't a worry for me on Sunday I, I get it but I'm I'm really looking forward to it really looking forward to Friday yeah I think we all are obviously after beating Newcastle we want to create that run like you kind of said in, the, in terms of the fixtures that are coming up the fixtures that you'd like to think Spurs will hopefully take all three points but yeah. Jay coming to you do you think there's going to be changes in this game kind of like Ben said or are you intrigued to see if he keeps it the same if it uh if it ain't broke don't fix it uh would kind of be what I said you know it's uh yeah it seems like going away from home doesn't shouldn't really phase Ange. I don't think Ange would be phased. It's kind of like, at the minute, as a club, we just kind of got a blind faith in him. You know, if you look at the Chelsea game, you know, we played nine men. We had nine men and we were defending on the halfway line, but we were loving it. And then when we looked back and we were like, what? How, how as fans, were we enjoying, you know, playing with night? Like, you know, we'd be like, oh, no, got to be conservative. You just got to trust him. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where the confidence of the team comes from at the minute. They, I think the players have got the same blind trust in him that we have. And, you know, the last couple of games, have, it's not worked, but just clicks back into place like that. You know, it just, you know, it just seemed to click back in. And I think, I think, yeah, the same starting 11 needs to be had really. Um, and yeah, as long as Romero has a talking to before, because, yeah, I could see something happening at the weekend. I don't want to jinx it. But the only thing with Forrest, and this is going to hope no Forest fans are watching this, but, you know, me and you were talking about it the other day. You know, you don't really notice Forrest are in the league. They don't they don't beat anyone big, and then they beat all the teams they should beat, and then they just kind of float around. So, hopefully, not jinxed it. If Holly had said it, it would have been a jinx because she is the biggest jinx in the history of Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. Um, but yeah, fingers crossed, and you know, we pick up a win. 
So I can blame you now if we lose the following. <laughs> you, yeah. me. Yeah. Um, but Gav, you kind of in the same boat. You want to see the same team, or do you may want to chuck the Celso in there and see how he thrives? I'd be surprised if he changed it because I think Forrest are a big physical team, and I think Saar and Basuma and that midfield are going to be key. I think Richarlison will do a better job against the centre backs than maybe Son would in this game because I think Forrest mm-hmm. are going to let us have the ball. Don't think they're going to press us too much in the in in the, you know, I don't think they're going to come run at us because they'll be fe- fear to get opened up. I think they'll let us have the ball in their own half and then they'll try and press us. But I think we've had a result that well, that Forrest got a, a result at the weekend because I think if they had a loss, they were going to sack him and possibly bring in a new manager. And I think a new manager, and from what I'm hearing, it's pretty much done that it's going to be one of two. Um, I think the ex Frankfurt manager or the ex Wolves manager, Lapategi. So I think they're pretty, it's very much like I think they're basically waiting for another mistake before they sack him because I think they're under a lot of pressure because the fans actually want to keep Cooper. Always, I think he'd be gone. It's usually the power of fans in, in, in football. I mean, if, if they want the Cooper out, he would be gone because the owner clearly wants him gone. Um, but the fans really want to stick with him. So, I think we've had a result because from what I'm hearing, the, the players aren't exactly enjoying the football, the, the tactics. Because if you remember when Cooper, when they come up, they were playing that attack on football and they were losing quite heavily. And since he kept them up last year, he changed in his tactics. Um, it's actually something like, you know, Burnley are being criticised at the moment for it and they haven't changed really yet. Um, but, you know, we'll be interested to see come a point if company does change like Cooper did last year because they were definitely going down. Um, so I think we've had a result because I think that new manager bounce is always something you want to avoid especially being away from home on the TV Friday night, it would have been a lot more difficult, I think, because I think sometimes when a new manager comes on, it creates a lot of unpredictability in games because players tend to up their level. So definitely that's been favourable. And I think at the minute, it's a, it couldn't be happening for us at a better time. I think it's one of them grounds. It will, there will be good atmosphere anyway, but I just think if you get an early goal there, I think they might they might retreat completely and fold. Um, so I think, again, it's down to us to go there and do that. But I'm very, very confident because of the performances I've seen. How I have no reason to doubt the team. Um, I would stick with the same team. I think he will stick with the same team unless there's an injury concern. Um, and as you say, the, the great thing about about football at the moment and for us is I think we've got four games over the next two weeks. And it just seems so long this year that because we've been playing so well and we've known my week games really, apart from these Christmas run-ons, it seems like it's taken forever to watch us. Um, whereas last season when we were playing, I was like, oh, do we have a game tonight or do we have to watch this? And we're watching out of loyalty, not enjoyment. So, um, no, it's great to have so many games. And I think the lads make great points. You know, Forest, Everton, Brighton and Bournemouth for four games, we should all be capable of winning with so many games coming up. Like you said, Liverpool, Arsenal, Liverpool, United. I think Man United play Villa on New Year's Day um, around that time. Anyway, so, or Boxing Day, sorry, that's Boxing Day. So a lot of teams are playing each other around us. And if we can get 10 to 12 points between now and New Year's Eve, that would stand us in really good stead but it all starts with Forrest and I think again it's it's a great time to go there um, if, there ever, if, there, if there ever is one to go there so no very confident Holly and I'm definitely confident now that we've obviously managed to get uh, have four shots and they go I know one was a penalty but we've had four well, shots think, and we've scored four goals <laughs> well I'll tell you what Holly I think that's the only thing we need to be a bit more clinical I don't mm-hmm. think you know in games even like even the game in, on yesterday I know we scored four goals but we could have scored ten we've had yeah. a lot of missed chances and I think we have to that's what's been coming back to haunt us uh, in these games. But look, the good thing is for you, Holly, I come on but after the Burnley game, which we won. We then went to Sheffield and won. And then we <laughs> texted me last week, we come on, we won. So if it's going if it's going by the history books, we're, we're going to get an R1 next week and that'll be four to four for me. Happy days, as long as Jay hasn't jinxed it. Um, but no, it's been good to obviously dissect everything tonight with you guys. Thank you to everybody that's tuned in live. We'll go around and say our goodbyes. So first of all, I'm going to start with Ben. Thank you so much again for joining tonight, Ben. Uh, where can everybody find you? Uh, thanks for having me on, Holly. Pleasure as always. Uh, ben Talks Football on TikTok and on Twitter. You can find me there. Amazing. Thank you so much. And Jay as well. Uh, thank you again for joining me. Uh, where can everybody find you? Uh, yeah, you can find me on, on Twitter normally, you know, Potch Agenda as always. And yeah, you can find me on Twitch, twitch.tv stroke JJ Season. Uh, I'm normally smashing my mates at Football Manager. So uh, yeah, make sure you go over and watch that. He's definitely done that just so you can clip it and send it to him. So no, They're already <laughs> watching. I know they're watching. I see you, Wally. I see you, Wally. <laughs> no, but thank you, Jay, uh, for joining. And Gareth as well. Again, thank you so much. Where can everybody find you? Yeah, thanks, Holly. Great host, as, as always, keeping us all engaged and involved and great topics, as usual. So really enjoy coming on. Um, you can find me at Gareth Hotspurs. Always good good man to chat for football and always give me analysis. Do a bit of coaching as well. So 
I usually, I usually think I know what I'm talking about, but sometimes you don't always get it right. But um, no, hi again. Thanks for having me on, and a uh, pleasure. No, thank you so much. Um, and like I say, thank you to everybody that's tuned in. Uh, Holly Sot says live will be back again next Monday, uh, same time, same place. Hope to see you all then. And until next time, uh, come on, you Spurs. <laughs>